Good morning, everyone, and welcome to HIV Scotland's second live Q&A. And we are absolutely delighted to be joined by Professor Sharon Lewin, all the way from Melbourne. Hi, Sharon. Hi. Now, Professor Lewin is a leading infectious diseases expert and is the inaugural director of the Doherty Institute. She's also a professor of medicine at the University of Melbourne. Now, her main focus has been on basic translational and clinical research that's aimed to find a cure for HIV. She's authored over 260 publications and given over 100 major international invited talks on a HIV cure. She co-chairs the International Aid Societies Towards a Cure, cure Initiative and is the chair of the Ministerial Advisory Committee for Bloodborne Viruses and Sexually Transmitted Infections, advising the Federal Minister for Health in Australia. Now, I could go on, as uh, Professor Sharon Lewin has considerable accolades and positions, which is why we're exceptionally grateful to her for giving some time today um, in her very busy schedule to join us. Um, this discussion will likely cover a number of areas from HIV cure, coronavirus and more. If you've got any questions, you can still submit them by commenting on this video on Twitter, Facebook or YouTube. Now, Sharon, I wanted to get um, started on the topic on everyone's lips at the moment, COVID-19. Um, and I know um, from watching a video that you took part in just a few weeks ago at the University of Melbourne, you were asked this question, but I wonder if the answer might have changed at all. Um, so you know exactly what it takes to respond to this pandemic. So what is it that we need to do and how are we doing globally? Well, um, thanks very much, Nathan, first of all, for um, having me on the show. I was actually in Edinburgh exactly a year ago. Um, oh. It's amazing to think um, how the world has changed in the last, well, last three months, but how things have changed um, just since a year. Um, so um, you're right, I did answer this question uh, in Australia, uh, in Melbourne on a panel, and um, I think I know what we need to do um, uh, and I might comment on how we're doing globally. Um, my view is at uh, the, uh, the moment all we have in our response to coronavirus is public health measures and that means testing, testing, testing so that people know either they're infected or not, um, rapid uh, isolation of people that are infected and quarantining those that are exposed. And, um, and that is the only thing that we have in our armamentarium and, of course, physical distancing because that's the only way that we can separate people that um, are infected and uninfected and don't know. And so they're pretty crude. Um, so physical distancing is a pretty crude tool, and, um, and, but the testing actually needs quite sophisticated strategies to get testing up really high. And you need quite sophisticated strategies to quarantine and isolate people well. Um, and so that's in the short term all we've got and that's what we have to do. And it feels a little strange for me to be speaking to you in the UK um, because I know that you are facing an absolute major, major um, disaster in the country uh, with an incredible number of deaths and a major assault on your health care system. And I'm speaking from Australia where we've had a very different outbreak. So um, I think, you know, we can talk more about what that means. But in Australia, our numbers are small. We, Australia's 25 million people. We've had 6,000 cases mm. and you know, under 100 deaths. So it's nothing like what you are facing at the moment in the UK. But what Australia has done has been high rates of testing and very um, aggressive approaches to quarantine and isolation. Actually, we've looked largely to Asian countries to influence our approach. So we've tried to mimic what's been done in Singapore, in Taiwan, in South Korea, in Hong Kong. That's very much, it's kind of interesting to me sitting in a country like Australia, but we are in the middle of Asia Pacific. That's very much influenced our thinking in the response. So we are at a very different um very different situation to the UK, Europe and, and North America and I feel for everyone in your um, country now, in particular in the healthcare sector, how much, how difficult this must be for everyone. Um, how we're doing globally? Well, um, you know, it's, we're very, very concerned about what's happening globally. Um, I think uh, we're seeing some good news or some um, Numbers turning around in some countries in Europe, which is good, I think, 
from what I know, the UK is still in a difficult position with large numbers of diagnoses and deaths, but at least you have a, um, not at least, but you do have a, a very highly functioning healthcare system and a focus on public health and universal health coverage. And I think once UK ramps up its testing and, and all the things I talked about, I'm sure we'll see things turn around, but I'm really worried about what's happening in the US. Where, um, again, um, they will, will have fantastic technologies and they ha are ramping up testing, but the politicising of public health and because there's this big economic impact of COVID-19, we're getting very unusual a separation of what the science is telling us and what, you know, business leaders are telling us. And that is worrying me greatly. And then, of course, what's happening in low middle income countries, I don't think we've even really begun to appreciate what will happen or what is happening in those countries. Yeah, How, got yeah. So that's sort of my, my take on it currently. We've got some questions about about that coming coming up, but I just want yeah wanting to pick up a bit on that politicisation, you know, and the I guess because of the impact on the the economy, which is very different from the HIV pandemic. I guess that's what probably makes them both different. Um, is that there's it's not everyone being told to stay indoors at, at that time in the eighties and nineties, but now we've got public health experts battling with economists and business leaders to try and, and to try and get over this pandemic and we're seeing that in the UK now where even the support for businesses to stay closed and and stay safe is starting to be rolled back which is going to mean that either businesses open and risk people's lives or they have no money and can't afford to uh, afford to live yeah, I mean, I think, you know, the situation is clearly different because, as you say, COVID-19 is affecting absolutely everyone, which was different to HIV and then having this big impact on the economy. But the um, the principles are the same for me in that um, when you make a public health, effective public health decisions need to be informed, you know, by science and the community and have strong leadership. And those three ingredients are were key and are key for HIV, and they're still key now. So ignoring the science doesn't make much sense either. Yep. Because if you do the economic if you do the economic analysis of having a surge of people hit your hospitals and these deaths um, and then go into more severe shutdown, that's not good either. So the site the, we have to be having responses that are evidence based and also um, you know uh hit fantastic engagement with the community because it's the only way you can take people along with you and this is so much this is i mean hiv of course was very challenging but this is challenging at another level because you have to take the whole community with you so how do you get you know trust in policies that hurt you from a whole community it, it, it's kind of interesting to see in australia what has worked and what hasn't worked and um and what gets people to you know come along with you it's 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 a, it's a major challenge and in country of some other countries maybe like singapore south korea taiwan where communities are much more accepting of just being told what to do mm. and maybe they do have more trust in their governments or they get tr trust that they're going to be looked after um and in some ways the uk you know the economic stimulus package from the uk of um supporting people with 80% of their salary that they came up with quite quickly. I mean, that's an incredible thing. I'm mean, not not every country has that. Um, anyway, so it's still that same interaction between science, community, leadership, and um, you cannot have a public health response that's not informed by the evidence. So the next question we've got sort of it really follows on for that. So I wonder if there's much much to add. But what are the lessons do you think that we're learning from the HIV pandemic in responding? To, to the current the current COVID COVID pandemic. Well, I think there are these the um, public health issues that I talked about, um, and a community, you know, which are, again are evidence informing policy, um, community engagement, and at a at a at a totally different level because it's in all communities, but it's still absolutely important. Um, stigma and discrimination still really important. Um, 
in uh, not so much around whether you have the disease or not. I haven't heard that many episodes of stigmatization around that, at least in my country. Um, but there's this stigmatization of, you know, um, who the origin of the disease and this whole, you know, narrative around China. And we have seen in Australia earlier, less so now, discrimination against people, you know, Chinese um, ethnicity. So terrible discrimination. And so, um, I mean, that's sort of something that's very similar. And, um, you know, I'm a scientist, clinician scientist, um, and the successes in HIV have been for a range of reasons, much of it because of community advocacy and community engagement and all the different things that HIV taught us. But added to that, you know, science just transformed HIV, you know, getting antiviral drugs even and, and, and getting great testing um, and getting great ways to monitor people and making drugs cheap and all that scientific advance, you know, we, we urgently need that here. Um, and I'm, I actually think a lot of the scientific approaches are in fact informing some of the pro approaches now with COVID-19. Mm. Now, the Doherty Institute has been working on the ASCOT study, um, looking at medication that I believe is currently available and whether that could translate into treatment for COVID-19. I was just wondering if, could you talk about what the, the ASCOT study and what you hope that will achieve? Yeah, the ASCOT study um, is a, what we call platform trial, which is a trial of randomising people to different treatments that can change and adapt over time based on newest knowledge and what is and isn't working. And you have a, a, a similar large platform trial in the UK. I've just forgotten the acronym, but, and the recent remdesivir trial that many of you may have read about was also a platform trial. So it's a platform trial, and at the moment it will randomise people to um, four arms, um, standard um, and, and, and then it's looking at antiviral drugs. It's looking at Kaletra and HIV protease inhibitor that has activity in test tube models against COVID-19, unclear if it has benefit clinically. Hydroxychloroquine that all of you would have heard about because it's President Trump's favourite drug. Little controversial, quite a few small studies, some show some benefit, some show no benefit at all, benefit at all, and some studies show that if you use it at high dose, it can be toxic. So there's a bit of a cloud around hydroxychloroquine, but hydroxychloroquine still does work as an antiviral drug, at least in a test tube model. And then the two drugs together, taking that lesson from HIV, that um, if you put two antiviral drugs together, you can prevent resistance and sometimes increase potency. So it will randomise to those four arms, Kaletra, hydroxychloroquine, or both. Now, if a lot more information comes out or another very good randomised study comes out showing no benefit of hydroxychloroquine, we may drop that arm and, and um, use something else. But that's the design of ASCOT. Oh, the other thing about ASCOT is it's um, enrolling people that are in hospital from COVID-19 but not very unwell. So they're not in intensive care. And that's a re if you if you want to sort of understand all these different results that are coming out of clinical trials, that is really important. Who was your population that were treated? Were yeah. they treated early in disease or once they got very sick? And different to HIV, um, the virus seems to play a different role in COVID-19. Um, the virus is, is replicating at higher levels early in disease. And then when people get very sick in their second or third weeks, just like Boris Johnson, there's mm. usually less virus around and and what's making people sick is you get this sort of aberrant immune response to the virus. So in HIV, we could use antiviral, you, you, you know, antivirals work at any stage of the disease, whether you're super sick or very early, the virus causes all of the problems. It's a little different in COVID-19. You've got mm. virus there at the beginning, but then it's the immune response that's causing the problem. So when you're looking at these studies, it's really important to think about who are the population enrolled. And ASCOT will look at a population of people that have mild to moderate disease, not in intensive care. Now, following on from that, um, 
Patrick Strudwick, um, who's a journalist from BuzzFeed, um, I spotted this morning as I woke up, I was asking a question on, on, on this sort of topic. So I asked his permission if I could ask you the question, um, because he asked if coronavirus symptoms can last weeks or months or appear to bounce back, could that be a reaction like HIV reservoirs where latent cells lie dormant, hiding from the immune system and from treatment and ready to replicate? Yeah, very good question. Um, and I'll just, I don't, the, the short answer is no. I don't think there's a long lived form of coronavirus. Um, it's an, coronavirus is an acute infection. You make an antibody response to it, and most people clear it and have mild symptoms and clear it over um, two to four weeks, essentially, clear the virus completely. Um, and then you have about 20% of people that get much sicker with it and end up in hospital and about 5% they get really sick with it and end up in intensive care and usually that's because of this over exuberant immune system but I think what that journalist is referring to is that some people can have a positive throat swab which means you detect the virus in their throat swab for weeks um, out to three four five weeks and what does that mean and then some people have had positive throat swabs, then it's gone negative and then it's gone positive again. And that's what's raised this issue of um, are you, can you be reinfected or do you have this chronic reservoir? And um, I think that, that, that that's unlikely. Some people just prolong, excrete, for, excrete virus for a prolonged period of time. And the reason most likely, this hasn't been really proven, but what I think is the most likely is that they go from positive, negative to positive. Is because the throat swab's not perfect. It's not like taking a blood sample when you have your viral load tested. Take the blood, you know you've got a fixed volume and you can measure exactly how much virus is in there and that's what we do for people's viral loads. But in a throat swab, it's, it's much less accurate because you stick this, you know, um, swab in someone's nose. You don't, the quality of the collection is really important, how far you put the swab back. And so you can get, you can miss cells in the throat swab and that for the, the, the test result becomes negative. So it's, it could be just that your testing regimen is not as accurate. And we're actually still even measuring viral load, you know, how much virus there is, it's not as accurate yet as what we have in HIV, for example. So I think um, there's no evidence in, in, in Nate, you know, that we, there's loads of coronaviruses around um, in addition to COVID-19 there that basically cause the common cold. Um, we know about coronavirus infections in animals. There isn't a chronic form, it's an acute infection and just some people take longer to clear it. So we've got a question following on from um, the questions on trials from Will, who is um, aware that there's some in ICU who've been enrolled in a study using azithromycin, um, which is an antibacterial antibiotic. Um, do you know any more about this sort of trial and why perhaps an antibiotic is being studied in this way? Yeah, I think there's two reasons why azithromycin might be studied. Um, the first is it's it's a pretty good antibiotic against many causes of pneumonia and people that are sick in intensive care and have a tube down their throat are at high risk of pneumonia. And um, I know of one study actually in intensive care, a similar, it's a, a study that's international called REMAP-CAP, it's in the UK and it's in Australia. And they're looking at the use of um, basically preemptive antibiotics. So you give antibiotics before people get really super sick. Um, and then, but the other reason why um, azithromycin is being talked about with, um, with COVID-19 and it's, I think this is unlikely to be the reason why um, the, the, they received it in ICU, but COVID-19 in one, and azithromycin in one study, um, when used together with hydroxychloroquine, seemed to have a, a greater reduction in virus in the throat swab. Um, why that happened, unclear, you're right, it's an, it's an antibacterial agent, but actually these drugs, azithromycin is part of a family of drugs called macrolides, and they also dampen down inflammation. So it's possible that the that um, 
viruses often replicate better in 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 in, in an inflamed environment. So one possible explanation is that it worked. Azithromycin doesn't work in a test tube model to see if it if it blocks the virus. So maybe it worked in people because it reduces inflammation. So in summary, um, either because it was for a bacterial infection, which is common to have when you're very sick in intensive care or it's because of this study that was done in France that showed together with hydroxychloroquine, it seemed to have an antiviral effect. Mm. Now, one of the questions we, we had was around um, if COVID-19 had influenced current research studies looking for a HIV cure. And I know just before we went live, you 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 made some interesting analogies um, <laughs> for your work on the HIV cure. I wonder if you can share the impact that 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 COVID-19 has had on on looking for a HIV cure or vaccine. Yeah, well, I was um, telling Nathan that um, you know most research has stopped, unfortunately, in many parts of the world because. If the country's in lockdown, which we have been in Australia, we hopefully we'll have it lifted next week. And I know across the US and I know in the UK as well, all non-COVID research essentially stopped, including and clinical trials have been paused because um, most hospitals were wanting to keep people away from their hospitals unless they had to be there. And so clinical trials were sort of deemed as um, non-essential. And um, so effectively, these studies have all paused. That doesn't mean I'm not reading and thinking about HIV, but my lab has actually been um, not active for like the last six weeks now. And um, my, I, as Nathan said, I'm a clinician scientist. I run clinical trials, and I also do basic laboratory work. And when you work with HIV in the lab, um, not with patient cells up with the virus itself you do it in a high containment environment which we call a level three high containment and COVID-19 you also work in level three high containment and it's quite specialized um, skills that you need so all my staff are highly trained for this level three environment and we have a big facility here at the Doherty Institute so a lot of them are now working on COVID-19 because there's this, there's this you know real urgency to move the field forward and we have this highly skilled workforce so um once we reopen most of them they will go back to hiv but i was saying to nathan that um i feel like i'm sleeping with another virus i've worked with uh, hiv for like my whole career and now I'm suddenly playing around with another virus but it'll be temporary it's a brief fling and then i'll be back so does I mean I think you've sort of answered this question that was our next one but do you think therefore that the knowledge in looking for either a HIV cure or vaccine is being helpful in that research for a vaccine or cure for coronavirus? Hugely helpful and you look around the world um, so much of a, so many people working in this field um, come from HIV. Of course, they come from influenza and coronavirus, but you know, HIV trained this whole um, generation of clinicians and virologists and immunologists. It kept that field. It was critical for the advances of HIV, and it um, actually was this unbelievably productive scientific community that um, have a lot to offer in in, in COVID-19, there's a lot of similarities. You look at what's happening in the vaccine world, the main front runners for vaccines for COVID-19 right now all come from HIV. That doesn't mean that they were successful yet in yeah. HIV, but the Oxford vaccine was developed, Jim Padano uses a weakened form of a, a cold virus that infects monkeys called chimp adenovirus, chimpanzee adenovirus that was developed initially for um, HIV now being used for COVID-19. The other lead vaccine coming out of the US comes from a company called Moderna that uses the genetic code of COVID-19 to make a vaccine. It's never actually been done, um, but uh, they developed a lot of that technology for other RNA viruses. So HIV is an RNA virus as is COVID-19. They replicate differently but there's a lot of similarities in how we measure and um, induce immunity. So the RNA virus is another company called Inovio developing another type of vaccine that also comes from HIV. So 
huge, huge amount of expertise in vaccine development and then antiviral drug development, antivirals, HIV antivirals um, were the first drugs to be developed um, what we call rationally, meaning that you had um, the shape of HIV and you could design a drug that fitted in a pocket of the virus to block it. Um, and that's opened up a whole field of, sort of rational drug design and um, that led to cures for hepatitis C and that's all happening now in COVID-19. And then we've got this whole other area of repurposing drugs. Like it's fascinating to me that an HIV drug like Kaletra could mm. work against COVID-19. When I first heard it, I kind of said, oh, impossible. No way. Because you know, HIV, it was a designer drug. It was designed just for HIV. But there are these overlaps with um, these, vi you know, all RNA viruses have a few similarities. And actually what we might, you know, have, what would be, um, incredible outcome from COVID-19 was to develop some sort of broad spectrum antiviral. You might have heard that term before for antibiotics. We use, we have some antibiotics which cover a whole lot of different bacteria. We call them broad spectrum antibiotics. Well, antivirals, we've always sort of thought about them as this one's for HIV, yeah. this one's for flu. Um, for some of the HIV drugs work against hepatitis B, but we might develop more or have, you know, work out ways to develop better broad spectrum antivirals. So I think the knowledge um, and then uh, there's just so many, to me, so many different parallels. And then the whole, and PrEP, that's another really. I was, I was just about to ask about that in terms of, you know, when you you said specific, Kalitra being used specifically for HIV, and then I was I was thinking, is is there something in those kinds of studies, whether it's, it's PrEP for people, that are using it as preps or HIV negative and using it to prevent HIV, or is it people that are using these drugs because they're living with HIV, and is that preventing them getting coronavirus as well? Yeah, no. Um, I was talking. That's an interesting point. I'll I'll come to that in a minute. Um, uh, but um, you the concept of prep that you can take an antiviral drug to prevent you getting infected was pretty 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 much a game changer. You know, most infections aren't treated like that um, or aren't prevented like that. Um, you can, I mean, for example, malaria, you go to a malaria area, you take malaria prophylaxis, that is prep. So it does exist um, and you can do it for flu. But so people very quickly jumped on to prep for COVID-19. So I, I don't know about the studies internationally on this, but in Australia, there's a COVID-19 prevention study, so healthcare workers taking hydroxychloroquine as an antiviral drug to prevent them becoming infected with COVID-19. And um, the uh, and I understand there's a similar study in Spain using yep. Truvada. Um, Truvada, I, I was unaware of it having an anti-COVID effect, but I guess theoretically it could. And so Truvada to prevent COVID-19. And I haven't seen any kind of convincing data that people on antivirals for HIV or for PrEP are less likely to get COVID-19, except that, um, you know, and you probably, I don't know whether you've discussed this before, but what has been published is that people with HIV um, on, on anti-HIV drugs or off anti-HIV drugs don't seem to do, do worse with COVID-19 than if you didn't have HIV, which is really interesting because it's different to most other infections. Yeah, I think that's, that's been what's interesting. Certainly in the UK, I know that we've been looking in clinics at the, le the number of people living with HIV that have been tested positive for coronavirus being much less than we would expect mm. in the population and whether that's because of specific treatments that they're on or just that, you know, in the UK anyway, I don't know if this was the case in Australia, but when the first list of people at high risk of coronavirus came out, HIV was what on that list. And that put a lot of anxiety among people living with HIV and it had to be rolled back by, you know, the British HIV Association and the HIV Scotland and other organisations who had to tell people living with HIV actually what the what the specific HIV science was because everyone had been lumped into this one homogenous group of people living with HIV. But as, as you know as well, if you're taking treatment, then 
and undetectable, there was not as as much of a risk as of high rate um, infection yeah. or, or disease. Now that's very interesting to me because um, I was following this really closely um, from the beginning um, and what was happening in China. And what I was fascinated by was that HIV was never on the list. It was always, it was these unusual, on the list, not so much for increasing your risk of getting infected because everyone's at risk. It, yep. every, no one has any immunity. We're all at risk. But the risk of, um, and, and you know, it, your, your risk is purely related to whether you contact the virus. But the risk of um, getting sick with HIV, we're getting sick with COVID-19 you know, the twenty percent of people that land up in hospital, the five percent that go to intensive care, the one percent that die. You know, the list is very different to most of the lists that we have for severe infectious diseases. So it's high blood pressure, elderly, that's a common one, um, diabetes, um, heart disease, cancer. And actually HIV was it was never on that list at all as a risk factor. And um and so I was watching very carefully and then there were just these few case reports coming out in China and a small series that was in the Lancet recently. So they're, they're coming out now um, and everything that I've read seems to suggest people don't do work. So, yes, it could be the antivirals. It could also be that um, when you get really sick with coronavirus, um, it's it, as I was saying earlier. It's not so much. It's more the immune response to the virus. So if you're immunosuppressed from the point of view of your T cells, maybe you just can't mount that sort of immuno immune response. So if you've got cancer or if you've got blood cancer, you seem to get more severe disease. So it's a bit of a mystery. Yep. The, other thing, the other thing is that COVID nineteen reduces your T cell count. Um, it reduces your lymphocyte count quite significantly, similar to HIV. But we haven't yet teased that one out. So we spent um, quite we spent about our, our first half talking about coronavirus. I know there's a couple more sort of similar questions coming up, but I wanted to to pivot onto your first love, as it were. Um, <laughs> and um, Lisa sent in a question last night um, that there's a couple of questions actually about this um, that I thought were quite interesting about whether you, as a HIV cure researcher, get annoyed at people encouraging the media to trumpet about a cure when they're only in early stage trials and how this might impact, you know, how the search for a cure is seen by the public. Yeah, you know, my experience is it's very rare to for researchers to um, encourage the media to talk about cure. It's usually the opposite. The media mm. might trumpet that it's important yeah. that there's been this big advance because you know they just don't like writing things like you know it's a small step it doesn't mean it's a cure you know they like to but and actually my experience is um even when you talk to them about that like this is a small step it doesn't mean it's a cure it gives us some encouragement whatever it is yeah. um they may put that in the article and then they slap this headline on you know cure for hiv from australia they just they and it's off, and then and then the journalists tell me it's my editor made me put on the flashy hit. So it's it's I think it's very rare. Most um, most researchers are usually very conservative about, and they know what it means just to get a small signal in a in a trial. They know it's not you know a cure for everyone. So I think it's a bit about how scientists communicate. Maybe we can always do better. It's a bit about. The journalist, a bit about the editor wanting to make headlines, and in the end, it causes tremendous confusion. When and there's, and there's huge interest in this, like with the London patient, um, uh, that um, or the you know all the patients that were cured, you know the media. There's just huge interest in it. So um, from both media and a community level, so it gets covered. You know, usually though, interestingly, um, you know, COVID nineteen hit. Um, in March, when you know the update on the London patient was presented at a big meeting in um, Boston, and it probably didn't get as much coverage because everything was focused on COVID nineteen. Yeah. But anyway, um, it, it's not. It's 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 usually and it, yes, it does irritate me because it obviously fuels all this excitement of some and often some misunderstanding and yeah. um and uh, yeah, that's not. It's not good for people living with HIV either. Yeah, so the next question follows on from that in, in terms of 
does that media interest and, and you know that sub editors putting up a nice big flashy headline does that then fuel some negativity when a cure trial fails or is it the kind of thing that you know I, I hear from some people living with HIV that they don't want to be involved in any discussions about a cure because they've been led up the garden path so many times by the the press and, and the, the good news stories that are coming then when they fail they feel really dis- disappointed and and there's that negativity so do, do you get that feeling as well that that high media interest in early stage trials is fueling that negativity when when they fail yeah you know i haven't experienced that so much i'm i my focus our focus a bit in australia has been to try and provide lots and lots of education around cure to community and the reason why and and obviously we don't capture everyone um we'll only capture a subset of people that are interested but we do run a lot of community events we um i mean not me we know in partnership with community um we have a a website atribucure.com.au where we review the latest literature but most importantly try and explain why this is really complicated and complex and why it's challenging and why we seem to be making baby steps in this not huge leaps and why it will take a while so i think the more that we can um educate and explain to people it's a bit like saying, you know, why isn't there a cure for cancer? Um, when, you know, we know that cancers are all different and some of them have done very well and others are very, very hard to treat. So there's just a, a complexity in nature in with cure that um, we just have to, you know, keep um, talking about. And it's, it's really important in, um, I do a bit of work in low income countries on cure through the International Aid Society and we do, um, run these workshops in South Africa and we've done them in Uganda and other places and you know it's um it's really important in in low and middle income countries too for people to understand what a cure means what we're trying to achieve why it's hard you know it's it's because there's a lot of you know you've got to get that message out so people understand it and go on the journey with you yeah yeah one of the the next questions that came in was was and I think you know, that sort of education and understanding, I think, is really important. So this question came from Ant in asking, do you think sometimes the news about a search for a cure can overshadow the current successes, but also the ongoing challenges of HIV in the present? Definitely, definitely. Because a cure just kind of sounds a sexy kind of thing to do um, when really it's, you know, a lot of people are doing tremendously well on a single tablet a day. Um, viral load suppressed, leading very normal lives, may not even, you know, quite happy or taking injectable drugs or PrEP or um, or still experiencing stigma, you know, a cure won't eliminate, won't necessarily eliminate stigma associated with HIV, for example. So I do think it can overshadow and I think it's because people like, like that sort of news story of just a simple solution, just, you know, cure it and it's, and it's all over. And um, we, we do a lot of work um, in cure on what we call remission, which means that you can stop antiviral drugs as one goal of cure research. The virus is still there, but you don't need to take antivirals every day. Well, um, you know, the issue of stigma is not going to go away with remission because people stigma is, is driven by all these other things. So I, I totally agree, but it's it's uh, and I don't think it's intentional. I don't think it's cure mm. research running around saying this is the most important yep. thing. I think there's so much there's so many aspects of HIV that still need to be addressed and cure is one of them. It won't and it won't solve everything either. No, I think you're right, and it is that sort of. It goes back to that editor splashing, well, what you call sexy headlines, you know, and 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 trying to get that sort of interest because it does makes people go, oh, that's that's really interesting. I think sometimes when you have big advances like you know the U equals U campaign, it took years to get that splashed in a newspaper, certainly in the UK, mm-hmm. about how important that was. Um, whereas a, a stage one. Um, cure trial would be all, all across it from 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 day one. So 
I think there is uh, the role of the media rather than the role of the people that are doing the work that might be feeling yes. that. Yeah. I'd, I'd really, um, I, I would perhaps call it a strange question, but I'll put it to you word for word because I think it's it's useful to um, to answer this. Andrew asked, um, the structure of the virus, meaning HIV, makes it look man-made. Do you believe this to be true? No. The structure of the virus is the beauty of nature, meaning that there's so many things in nature that are perfectly um, formed and symmetrical, um, and it's just nature. First of all, also, the structure of the virus is... Um, is, uh, oh no, no, I was going to say that the structure of the virus, the pictures you see are, of course, pictures, but no, even, even when you look at a microscopic, well, we can look at the structure of the virus um, with an electron microscope, which means that you can see the tiny, tiny levels. And, um, and if you see the coronavirus, it's this perfect circle, right? You've probably seen an image of yep. a perfect circle with these little dots around the outside. I think it's just um, nature. And also when um, you're forming 3D structures, um, they, um, they just form, how, how, how those proteins are built up, they form this symmetrical structure. But very interesting question. Um, no, it's, it's just what, nature's kind of beautiful, even with viruses, they <laughs> get it sort of perfect. You couldn't have dream, dreamt it up better, but all viruses look like that. So there's been a couple of questions on specific key populations of people that perhaps living with or at risk of HIV and how they might be involved in cure research or, or vaccine research and not. So Will um, from Prepster asked, um, why are trans men continually excluded from vaccine trials? Yeah, I don't have um, any... Uh um, reason for that, um, I don't, I, I, I'd be interested to hear more. I know tr you, I often see trans women in many, um, in many prevention studies, but I don't know why they would be specifically, I think with PrEP it's a little different because it's a, it's related to dosing potentially of what you might have in a trans woman or man. Um, but I don't see a reason why you'd be why a trans man would be excluded from a vaccine study. I can't comment on that. I don't know anything about that. Okay, um, and one on women and the search for a cure. Uh, Nicoletta asked, "Is the search for a cure gender neutral, um, and what considerations are made about women's reproductive health and women in the menopause when we're looking for a cure?" Yeah, I think there's lots to know about. Um, there's lots of potential ways that um, gender has an impact on cure, um, and that's uh, so. So enrolling women in these studies is really important, and studying women more for cure studies is really important. And there's a few reasons why. Um, the first is that. Um, estrogen, one of the main hormones at high levels in women that um, obviously decreases uh, in the menopause, can have a direct effect on how the virus replicates in what we call latency. So when the virus goes into hiding, how hidden it is um, is important in um, clearing the virus. And so female sex hormones um, alter how active or silent the virus is on treatment. We know that now. Um, the immune response also responds differently in women to men. So they will respond to vaccines and um, drugs that are used to stimulate immunity um, if you're male or female. Uh, and so it's really important that we can study more and more women. In Australia, where um, you know, 90% of people living with HIV in Australia are male and less than 10% female. Um, we enroll very few women into our studies. It's usually in that range of about, you know, 10% maximum. But in other countries where um, HIV is, is, is occurs with equal frequency, men and women, you know, they do very well at enrolling women in space. For example, South Africa, um, there's some really excellent cohorts of women being studied um, in HIV cure studies, but it, it's it's not really replicated around the world. 
Yeah. Now, Barbara asked, um, uh, she submitted a bit of a comment in the question. She said, you know, we're now many years forward since um, it first emerged as an age-related disease, even before we recognised what is now known as HIV. What have we learned about the cause of HIV that we might then be able to learn how we prevent this type of virus happening again? And this is probably apt in light of, of COVID-19. Is it something about our different research methods um, that we have to adapt? Or is is finding a cure for something like coronavirus or HIV realistic? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, first of all, just about the last comment, um, a cure for HIV and for coronavirus, they're actually quite different challenges because um, HIV is this chronic infection. It gets entwined into the person's DNA and it stays there forever even when they're on treatment. And um, the big challenge for a cure is working out where it's hiding and getting rid of it, very, very challenging. In coronavirus, you don't have a long-lived form like that. It never gets into your DNA and people clear it. Some people might take longer, but everyone does, and some people, of course, die from it and never clear it. But um, people that survive, clear it. You don't have ongoing coronavirus infection. So I always, you know, the word cure is interesting. It's confusing, but I also think we need treatments for coronavirus and we need a cure for HIV. They're sort of different. Yep. And just about the origin, I mean, it's, um, you know, the origin of HIV is it came from um, an animal from the chimpanzee. That's very clear. Um, and uh, it made a species jump. So this virus, which was, you know, living in an animal somehow, change to become able to infect humans and then it must have um which is a very random and unusual event um and in and we now know that this did happen um in africa and it would have um and it would have happened from blood exposure to animals which is happening all the time to to monkeys which is happening all the time but there was this you know rant you know a random event of a species jump and then the and then what gave HIV its um, capacity to spread everywhere is then that could be human to human transmitted. And it is very similar to COVID-19, this species jump from bat to human, not sure still how it happened, and then the virus getting better at infecting, going human to human transmission. So I think the um, common thread here is around animal-human interactions um, that are um, part of our ecosystem I guess um, mm. happen and we need good ways to detect and respond to them um, HIV it happened and it took you know I, I sort of say that COVID-19 that the best thing for a virus is to spread when someone's completely well because that means the virus can get oh, yes. and can survive exactly. longer because yeah. it, um, it can spread while you're well so HIV was the master at that and that's one advantage that COVID-19 has got over previous SARS, that it could spread while you're completely well. So I think these viruses that move from animals to humans, um, I think we're, it's part of life. Um, and we'll see, we have seen more of it in the last few decades, particularly the last decade. And we'll see more of it. And we just, we need to get better at, um, well, there's a whole lot of issues about climate change and, and, and um, how people live, but we need to get better at diagnosing and responding to them. Yeah. Mm. So you mentioned you, that you're doing some work or have done some work in low income countries. And this next question, I think, is quite relevant to that in, in both HIV, but also treatment for uh, COVID-19 in terms of what do you think the challenges would be at ensuring a cure for HIV or, as you put it, treatment for COVID-19 reaches every part of the world? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I am very involved with that and I think with HIV um, it's something we have to really make sure happens. Um, we had, did very well, we have done very well with antiretrovirals reaching every part of the world but still, you know, 40% of the world is not taking antiretrovirals and, um, and it took a long time. There was a big gap between 
availability of antiretrovirals in high income countries to low income countries. And um, we don't want to have a similar gap uh, for, um, for if we had a cure for HIV. So I've, I've been involved with an um, initiative from the International AIDS Society um, looking at de developing um, a what's called a target product profile, like what a cure might look like and therefore how easy would that be to deliver into low and middle income countries. And um, we will announce this, we've done a lot of work on this and it will be kind of launched, we hope, in time for AIDS 2020 in July, virtual conference, but we'll be able to launch it in July. And um, you know, there, I, I think the thing is that we need to think now um, what if we develop something super complex, it's never going to get to every part of the world. So we, we need to be working on things now that have the capacity to get to every part of the world. Having said that, that doesn't mean that we should not um, use, do complicated innovative things because those complicated innovative things can event can be simplified and we saw that with antiretrovirals. People thought antiretrovirals were too complicated to be in low middle income countries and then it was done, you know, well it is being done. So um, I think we have to um, make sure that funders support this, that, um, that it's a global effort. I think COVID-19 is a bit different because um, COVID-19, just by virtue of how it is transmitted with travel, it affects everyone. So therefore, um, high income countries can't ignore what's going on in yeah. low income countries. The problem at the moment is that so many countries have got such big problems in their own backyards that they're very focused and they have to be on addressing this issue. If you're in a country like the UK with huge numbers of deaths and, a, and an overwhelmed health system, you have to address the issue locally, but we can't forget that um, yeah. it, it's a global problem. You mentioned AIDS 2020, the virtual conference. I've just put some information down at the bottom. Um, HIV Scotland are running a number of scholarships for people living with HIV, students and young people to attend the virtual conference. So check out our website if you're interested in hearing that um, exciting news um, that Sharon was talking about. The net, we're, we're getting up to our, our last couple of questions now. Um, so thanks for, for bearing with us. Um, this question, I guess, after COVID-19, what is your immediate next step in research for a HIV cure? Yes, yeah, so after COVID, no, no, after, after COVID-19 return to my first love. Um, well, um, the main things that we are working on at the moment is, in my own group, is how to eliminate the virus and by targeting the virus and how to boost the immune system to mop it up, basically. And so we've been interested for a long time in these cancer drugs that um, boost the immune system. It's called immunotherapy. You may have heard about, you know, these new cancer treatments that can really cure skin cancer and lung cancer, a few other cancers. And it targets a part of the immune system that gets exhausted in people with HIV, even when they're on treatment, and in people in cancer, and um, that's called PD-1. And so we've been um, looking at how blocking PD-1 in people with HIV and cancer um, can restore the immune system. And um, we're planning a trial of very, very low doses of this drug in um, people living with HIV without cancer. And um, you have to go very carefully in these trials because um, these drugs can have side effects because they can overexcite the immune system and then people can get adverse events, which is why we want to try a super low dose of anti-PD-1. So that's sort of next cab off the rank. We've, we're aiming to get that study. We've been working on that study for a very long time. We have um, published a bit of work on um, using that at, using that drug in a test tube model and then we've presented some of that work on the effects of that drug in, in people with HIV and cancer. We presented that at CROI this year. But we've been really keen to see how the drug works in people that don't have cancer. And so we're hopefully going to start, that's the first thing that we're going to do as soon as COVID lifts, which is get that study going. 
And then we have a whole lot of other um, sort of interesting projects on waking up the virus, which has been tried by many people, but we're going to use, we're currently using these new delivery systems to get those drugs to target infected cells better. And also looking at new tablets that, new new approaches that lead to suicide of infected cells. So they're the sort of three areas that we're um, involved with. Cool. Sounds like there's lots of work to be done anyway. Um, so their final question really is about, um, you know, we've, we put this Q&A on because there's a lot of interest about HIV, but I, I wonder what your thoughts are about how people living with HIV could get involved in Cure Research. So you mentioned the um, hivcure.com.au website. Um, I, I'm just, is there ways that people living with HIV, you know, in Scotland can be involved in either the research or learning about the research about what, and what is a very technical and medical part of, of HIV? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm sure there's equivalent resources in the UK. Um, and uh, first of all, always talk to your doctor because your doctor, most clinicians are very interested in knowing about cure. They may not follow it closely, but they'll know about it. There's quite a few active um, uh, clinical trials. The UK, well, not so much in Scotland, but certainly in England, um, some uh, clinical trials that have been uh, very high profile, at least, and some very good cure researchers in the UK. Um, our website does explain cure science, we hope, in easy, accessible um, ways. If it doesn't, let me know, hivcure.com.au. Um, the IES, the International AIDS Society, have got um, a training program for um, which we run a community workshop every year before the International AIDS Conference and we'll do it again for AIDS 2020, a virtual workshop that's specifically for the community to um, explain and engage people in the current issues in cure research. That's every second year. And there's also some resources um, on the website. And AVAC, A-V-A-C, they also do quite a lot of good, simple um, uh, tools for understanding um, the science of HIV cure, what's happening. Um, and, uh, um, yeah, I think all those resources should be helpful. Great. Well, thanks so much for your, your time uh, today, Sharon. And I know it's evening in Australia. It's morning um, here in Scotland. Um, next Wednesday, we'll be joined in the evening, uh, 7 p.m., for a Q&A with Dr. Dan Clutterbuck and Dr. Daniela Brawley, who will be um, answering all your questions about HIV care, treatment and prevention in Scotland. Uh, but once again, thanks to, to Sharon. And if there's any other comments or um, questions about um, what we've been discussing today, do put them in the comments. Uh, this video will be um, posted on, on all our channels um, so you can watch it back if you've missed anything. Uh, but thanks and, and, and see you all later. Goodbye. Pleasure. Thank you. Bye.